I invite now uh, Matthew French uh, with the presentation Ethnography in of COVID-19 Rigorous Insights or a Cabinet of Curiosities. Yeah. Matthew, if you could um, condense it into 15 minutes and then about two or three minutes each to the discussants, Paul and John O'Brien. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. Thank you. Um, I speak from the perspective of being uh, doing PhD research in social anthropology. Um, so I'll try and present quite a sort of applied, practical, down-to-earth outlook. The Venegren Foundation is perhaps the foremost independent funder of anthropological research. Their website features a quote from a famous American ethnographer, Ruth Benedict. The purpose of anthropology, she says, is to make the world safe for human differences, end quote. Reading this whilst locked down for months, I felt it lacked wisdom. Doesn't COVID-19 put to rest any notion that humans can be safe amongst yet apart from different others? But actually, Benedict was probably misquoted post-mortem. So let's read instead from her 1946 Culture at a Distance account of Japanese society titled The Chrysanthemum and the Sword. Quote, the tough-minded are content that differences should exist. They respect differences. Their goal is a world made safe for differences, where the US may be American to their hilt without threatening the peace of the world, France may be France, and Japan may be Japan on the same conditions, end quote. So Benedict's point, simply put, was that human groups consider themselves different from each other, and some but not all members within such groups can respect such differences. I also sense an implicit proposition that people being safe is a function of mutual respect between tribes to which we each belong. Governmental responses to COVID-19 are scaffolded on this very footing with one size fits all lockdowns and vaccination strategies implemented within national borders. Tolerance then demands a noticeable suspension of critique of such responses as between nations. Yet for each individual within each family, social group, nation, the virus is an atomizing variable, feared or disdained differentially by age, health, wealth, personality, responsibilities, etc. We each perform our own bespoke doubt practices with the virus in our territory but off our map. COVID forces a focus on entanglement with perihuman cohabitants that are invisible, alien, indifferent to us we're thrown into a reappreciation of an age old inescapable tumult of what Anna Tsing calls more than human sociality. She has long urged ethnographers to generate multi-species research that is decentered from anthropocentric paradigms. Almost 15 years ago now, anthropologist Celia Lowe attempted in exploratory fashion to engage ethnographically with the H5N1 avian flu. This was in Indonesia. Key obstacles to decentered research were very evident, such as how can we study the social world of non-humans with whom we share no means of communication? How can we understand what we cannot know? Any virus is inherently elusive. Microbiologists described avian flu as quasi-species, biotic entities, clusters of genomes with unstable boundaries. If bird flu had a, had a face, it only presented to the alarmed Indonesian population as mutant swarms or clouds. So how can and should anthropology respond to the provocations presented by COVID-19? Well, as from March 2020, the Venegren Foundation told all active researchers to suspend face-to-face -face field work. They hosted a dialogue with anthropology academics, seeking responses to the proposition that usual research methods had become totally impossible. Senior anthropologists responding to this, professors and such, disagreed, saying things like, crises generate opportunities, we're in a liminal state, it's the opportunity of a lifetime to observe what's unfolding, or we've dealt with disruption before, World War II, we had culture at a distance, the framework exemplified by Ruth Benedict, or we've got to advance digital anthropology. Uh, it's frankly shocking to see how many anthropologists still refer to the physical world as the real world. 
when you got responses uh, back to the Werner Gren from mid-level faculty, the faculty, they were much more equivocal, saying, for example, we need to begin by asking basic questions. Should we be doing research at all? Or, yeah, digital ethnography, that has a can-do approach, but our interlocutors will be in a can't-do mode. This situation poses challenges to the ways in which anthropologists have conceptualized the social. And right down at the base of the pyramid, junior faculty members seemed resigned to putting an immediate freeze on all fieldwork. For example, saying, I'm not convinced that any research can take place under the prevailing circumstances. It's very insensitive to be throwing questions at people who are faced with the most difficult circumstances in their living memory. Those who insist on researching are simply interested in their academic output. The survey didn't include views from funded postgraduate researchers. Unfortunately, many of those have no choices. Some can postpone if their funders will allow it. Others will have to adopt virtual methods and then perhaps change their research focus. So what comes from uh, this dialogue is a declining confidence in pandemic era fieldwork as we hear views from more junior yet more precarious academics. And when concerns are expressed about fieldwork in the pandemic, it's largely about the ethics of troubling or indeed infecting research participants. It's also about the validity of distanced methods. There's a conspicuous absence of academics pausing to consider whether their field sites, now made strange by COVID-19, should problematize theory established in their discipline. I referenced in passing there just one hesitancy, the person who said, well, maybe this situation poses challenges to the ways in which anthropologists have conceptualized the social. As may be evident, I feel strongly that the strangeness of our pandemic experiences, however individualized they may be, requires researchers to pause, reflect and critique theory itself. Listening earlier this week to a conference presentation by Bruno Latour, he categorized the pandemic as being radically disruptive of temporality to the point of collapsing our lives into a revelatory re-engagement with the spatial. He captures this also in the title of his latest book, Usuija, or Where Am I? To illustrate an experience of this freshly intensified existential question, I will share a very brief, I promise one minute only, autoethnographic vignette. Here goes. On Wednesday, 21st April 2021, between 1445 and 1515, I bought a book in the heart of Amsterdam. I had reserved my in-store shopping appointment a couple of days earlier via Eventbrite online. I walked excitedly for 45 minutes through Amsterdam streets that were almost empty. Having queued briefly, on entering the bookshop, the sole masked staff member scanned my printed QRT code and handed me a shopping basket containing a clockwork timer, visibly set to ring after 30 minutes. I was one of perhaps six visitors, each carrying ticking baskets. Otherwise, in silence, my spectacles steamed by my mask amidst three floors of books, a first smell of new books in over five months. I felt adrift. Waiting for a library angel to work its magic, a book eventually found me. I was hunting in ecology, sandwiched between sociology and philosophy racks. Then paying at the till, off went my clock, bring. I walked home thinking how strange it was to carry something that I wasn't going to eat. Some people walked very close by unmasked. Others turned masked faces to the wall in the old narrow streets. Rough yellow arrows had been sprayed underfoot, indicating an unpleased and ignored request for sort of up and down pavements. Trams rattled past empty. Children played football in side streets. Back home, closing my front door, dropping the book, I was overwhelmed with sadness. Now this bookshop had implemented in its own quirky manner the nationwide COVID restrictions on shopping. A combination of so-called social institutions, primarily government and city council, had intervened to hollow out the urban centre, attenuating the social fabric, rationing access to social inscriptions. The bookshop had therefore been laid bare as an asocial library sale curated whimsically by an absent owner. There were no informants readily available uh, to, in, to support an ethnographic analysis of this field. The passers-by were so scant that the law of small numbers 
revealed their heterogeneity. To expand this vignette into a case study would only accentuate its idiosyncrasies. And I fear this may prove to be typical of many first person accounts of pandemic era experiences. Hence my concern about a cabinet of curiosities. So why am I troubling you with this? Uh, when it, perhaps because it just troubled me. I'd expressly intended this to be both utilitarian and an auto ethnographic experiment. It turned out to have a dreamlike quality. And I think the feelings of anxiety and sadness had nothing to do with ethics or ethnographic method. It was to do with theoretical expectations being confounded. I'd made this mini pilgrimage to the urban core and with apologies to a, a well-known paper by Victor Turner, there was no center in there. A phrase from W.B. Yeats perhaps conveys my ethnographic startle. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. I'd expected this comforting trajectory, the mundane and familiar act of buying a book in a city center shop, but I found myself thoroughly upset, disoriented. The anthropologist Jane Geyer borrows from the Nigerian writer Ben Okri to describe such moments of ethnographic surprise as a quickening of the unknown. And I'll later propose very tentatively a short theoretical insight from that vignette. But first, I just turn again briefly to talk about what, what fieldwork can actually be undertaken in this pandemic, and if so, what ethnographies of COVID might achieve. Three of course, minutes opinions if possible. Have Three minutes if possible. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to a close. Opinions have always differed between ethnographers, as well as between anthropology and other disciplines, as to the degree of participation required to support fieldwork. The anthropologist Annika Lems says pithily, in the long run, looking out of the window cannot replace immersion in the social world. And the sociologists Fine and Abramson agree that, quote, if there's one profound truth about ethnography, it is that intimacy and not distancing is crucial, adding, to say the physical and digital are interchangeable or produce similar analyses is a methodologically indefensible false equivalence. In contrast, at my own research institution, scholars of digital anthropology unsurprisingly advocate for virtual fieldwork. A much watched YouTube video by the well-known Professor Daniel Miller says, even under these constraints, it's entirely possible you can go and do an ethnography just as original, significant, insightful, as anything you might have originally envisaged. I'm unconvinced, but I do agree with him later when he says that ethnographers need to be with their participants long enough to get a sense of repetition, typicality, normality. But this begs a key question. How can a researcher commencing fieldwork during the pandemic judge what normal looks like? There might be more value in researchers already familiar with field sites prior to the pandemic, returning to them to reappraise what they had thought to be normality. And Gonzalez and Marlowitz, discussing the effect of COVID-19 on Silicon Valley, state the obvious with hindsight that the pandemic has exacerbated social and economic fault lines, which in normal times lay mostly hidden. They also say in passing that technology infrastructures are very thin and unevenly distributed, even in Silicon Valley, so there isn't a, a common access to these means of having a research dialogue. They also make a very important point, which puts in question whether the social sciences engaging with digital ethnography, digital research has a political consequence. They say the tech revolution was long before the pandemic, a mass experiment in distancing and a corporate capture of information leading to situations resembling post-colonial authoritarian societies. So there's a, a question for another day, should anthropologists be facilitating that? When we look ahead, historians, economists, political scientists will be engaged for years to come in forensic analysis of the pandemic. There are many ethnographers who instead have this journalistic urge to document the events in real time. Philip Strong wrote about HIV, uh, criticizing outbursts of interpretation, rashes of moral controversy, plagues of control strategies. Yet there's this unconcealed appetite amongst many anthropologists to seize the rupture of COVID, to intervene towards achieving a better world in what I perhaps unkindly would label a sort of disaster developmentalism. 
Um, before concluding, I want to return very briefly to that autoethnographic vignette. The curiosities of the COVID era can, and I believe should provoke ethnographers to ask very open questions such as, why was this strange? What was obscured before? What have we come to lack? And I suggest tentatively that lockdown has denied us mundane but crucial and previously taken for granted rhythms of territorial passage. Arnold van Gennep tried to draw attention to these rhythms of living back in 1909. And he said that to live is, quotes to act, to cease, to wait, to rest, and then to begin acting again, but in a different way. Subsequent scholars, especially Victor Turner, reinvigorated, as we know, the discussion of liminality. But I think the work on territoriality and passage, spatially, is neglected. Van Gennep considered it was natural, vital even, for people to move in orbits. Unlike planets in space, the energy of these tra trajectories has to be, quote, regenerated at more or less close intervals. Now, this has been can, possible for so many. Can reach a conclusion, Matt? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So our homes have become hollowed out, asocial, without visitors. Available destinations elsewhere have become constrained, emptied. Life-sustaining trajectories have become suspended, as if the moon ceased to cycle through, our, through its phases. And we find ourselves marginalized in situ. A sense of spatial disemplacement, disemplacement I think, uh, was reflected in my disorientation in the bookshop. And these musings imply a larger question. Uh, where lies that which is sacred to each of us during lockdown? Arpad Sakalzi and Bjorn Thomason explain that Van Gennep considered the sacred to be relational and mobile relative to the where and when of a person's passage from one place to another. When we're static, does the sacred then wither? So my last comment is that I think the best of the ethnographies after, in the sense of inspired by the pandemic, may be mediational, I take this word from Adrian Ivakiv, which is about how relations are negotiated. And I have in mind here Isabel Stengers when she talks about ecology of practices. And she says we have a not a stable harmony or a peaceful coexistence, but a web of interdependent partial connections between heterogeneous beings, obviously not all of whom are human, who, who don't have transcendent common interest, don't have an arbiter distributing the roles, don't even necessarily have a mutual understanding, but have to jostle together. And that in turn echoes the conclusion by Celia Lowe, looking at the avian flu, where she said, our futures lie at the junctures where forms of the human, animal and micro meet and where each sustains and clouds the limits and the possibilities of the other. Uh, and just in case anyone's curious about what the book was that presented itself to me in the bookshop, it was Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, <laughs> which I think is quite apt. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, for this uh, lovely presentation. Um, time is running a little bit out, so please, Paul Stinner and John O'Brien, if you could um, condense your comments to about two or three minutes, and then if there is time on for Egor and Roger, I'm not sure we have time because about uh, 4.30 we need to finish up. Yeah, so Paul and John. Uh, do you want me to start or? Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Matthew. That was a very interesting paper, very uh, poetic, very well um, composed. Um, uh, lots of sort of components to it all threading into one another. So it was, it was quite difficult for me to sort of extract, in a sense, the the, the punchline. But I, I I take the punchline as being your your experience in the um, in the bookshop, um, uh, and and. Uh, um, so, you know, I, I guess I would want to focus on that and ask you to say a little bit more about what exactly you're drawing from that experience. My, my sense of it from, from, from my own perspective is, is that you're saying something like you've started off with a set of methodological questions. Should we be doing ethnography anymore as anthropologists or not? And in a sense, this would, you know, this is a technical expertise issue for discussion amongst anthropologists, which maybe many of us wouldn't, wouldn't have much interest in. Um, uh, but gradually, you 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 sort of, in a sense, through this experience, came to came to say that 
Well, there's, there's more to it at stake than this technical methodological question of anthropologists doing ethnography or not. There's a bigger question of, you know, theoretical expectations being being sort of called into question for you through coming to this bookshop and expecting to be able to do something ethnographic, but finding that there was no center there really. And that when you're back at home, there's no, you know, your, 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 your home is also not what it was. And so you, you have this sort of experience of somehow derealization, uh, kind of what I would think of as an uh-oh experience or a this is not experience. You know, this is not just the question of ethnography that you had uh, originally uh, expected it to be. It's something more, um, more um, important and profound, but more difficult to express. And, and so I gather that what you're then sort of doing is you're saying, well, we need a different vision of anthropology or is it even anthropology when it's in this different vision? So we need to take into account species beyond the, the, the human, including microbes and viruses and so on and so forth. And these are part of interconnected um, networks of things. And so part of what you're saying resonates with some of the points that were made earlier about the idea of the need for a sort of post-anthropological way of doing um, the, the human or the social sciences, something that we talked about earlier in the day as, as you know, we've been thoroughly anthropological since the 17th century and probably a little bit before, in fact, and, and, and have taken for granted a sort of humanocentric approach. So part of what you're saying seems to be sort of uh, um, resonating with, with, with that idea. One thing you didn't touch upon that I found very interesting in the paper, I followed up a paper, a paper that you mentioned by Chad Arivian and Raffaetta was about, are viruses alive? Uh, and you, and you, you mentioned that, 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 that they discuss a failure to consider viruses to be alive. I'd be interested to hear what you say about that because it seems to me, I, I do, I've done a little bit of research around the scientific literature on there, and it seems to me the current scientific con con uh, consensus is that viruses are not alive, they're not living creatures. I think it's quite Im an important question given that we attribute so much to them in terms of, sort of their, their demonic status and their, 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 uh, we're, we're in battle with them in wars and so on. But it, it, I, I'm aware that in the history of, of, of um, virology, the, 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 uh, the, there's been many contributions in the debate about viruses being alive or not that have actually fixed the parameters of what, count, what counts as, as, as life. And as I understand it, the reason that most contemporary biologists would consider viruses not to be alive is because they're not sealed into a unity. You know, they're, 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 they, they, they do not have the integrity that would be definitional for life according to the contemporary ways of thinking about life. So, that's my sort of response to, 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 to the paper, uh, you know, and, and maybe um, that's probably enough. So would you like to answer now, Matt, or yeah, if I, shall, if shall I we may, listen to, yeah? If, if, I, if I may, well, well, thanks very much, Paul, there's so much in there. Um, picking up on the last point about whether viruses are, are alive, um, there are obviously plenty of theorists who would say it doesn't matter uh, whether whether um, anything is alive or not, it still um, ha has a, a gentle quality. So Bruno Latour would say it might still be an actant. Um, uh, I think the the interesting thing about uh, the description in the paper, the extra paper you mentioned, is that uh, people in dismissing the, the 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 virus from the possibility. Uh, of, um, of being alive, and also people discussing viruses in the sense only of carrying disease, means that it's compartmentalized uh, viruses as being um, something that inconveniently comes along exceptionally, but which isn't uh, an intrinsic part of the tapestry of human living all of the time. Uh, and my point really about the trajectories and Van Gennep's work is when we look at the nature, how social is theorized, in partly, of course, it's theorized about humans meeting humans. And then in partly it's theorized about, uh, and this is more Dachymian, I suppose, it's theorized about there being a, a, a society aside from the human. But my point is that there's also this sort of sedimentation dynamic within what it is to be human, where we have trajectories and we move to and from places which become more or less important when we're there or not. And these things are, 
uh, my point about ethnographies after COVID, if you like, inspired by COVID, is that rather than just interrogating uh, what's happened in the pandemic, or what were the governmental responses, we should take this rupture as an opportunity uh, to revisit theoretically what's in our toolbox. Um, by, by asking these questions such as, well, what have we missed? We've missed these very mundane trajectories of going to the coffee shop where we usually read our paper, um, going for that walk in the woods. Um, and, and whilst we've had this flattening of life, we're then invited, and I think this is a political uh, interesting topic, we're invited to um, uh, focus on having missed what? The pub or the shop or the cinema. Um, and so we're invited to reconstruct what it means to have that social life by reference to what we're told that we missed. And I think it's very important for us to actually uh, work with our own experience of what did we feel the lack of, what, what was lost to us. And I think partly we also have to try and uh, touch on the humility of the experience, because for sure we're all now aware that there is more to our life than what we can see, or indeed more to our life than what we would technically describe as being living in the sense that it self-replicates. And, and actually, one of the just to finish, one of the definitions I read about whether a virus is alive or not, as you said, is it a, is it a closed unit? One of the definitions for being alive is that you can self-replicate reliably. Viruses don't do that. That's why they mutate. They don't replicate reliably. What could be more dynamic and alive than creating your own difference? So it's very difficult to pin down what we mean by alive. And I think it's probably doesn't land us anywhere that's uh, productive. I think it's more important to, ha to have this humble opening out of uh, what it is to be social, to include the non-human, uh, the biotic, the borderline abiotic, uh, everything that has a resonance for these trajectories which by which we sediment our existence. Uh, so let us now hear John and I'd suggest uh, after John to have uh, very shortly Egor because he's uh, he has a raised hand and uh, if there is time also Roger and then Matt will probably give us a um, short conclusion at the end. So John please. Uh Thank you, Matthew. That was a really interesting talk and I enjoyed reading your paper as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose what struck me about it is that this question of, you know, how can ethnography take place in the context of lockdowns? It, it's a very important question, you know, when we have this real difficulty with producing knowledge that is addressing experience, where we're kind of flooded with, you know, kind of like ideology with expert visions with kind of universal protocols that this is very important one thing that struck me is that the question is like is the pandemic something that's truly actually novel for ethnography you know is it an acceleration of trends that have already been present and um, i was thinking about paul rabino's work on ethnography where he talks about how this kind of ethnography which is based on kind of bounded cultural entities is something that kind of we can't really do anymore. Instead, we have to study kind of networks and connections. And this kind of like shift onto kind of digital ethnography <clears throat> is, is part of this trend, you know? So is, is the pandemic actually something that is truly like novel for ethnography in terms of methodological challenge or is it simply an acceleration? Um, yeah, so I guess like things that I thought were very interesting in your, in your work were um, the question about like time, because again, this goes back to Rabino's idea about the acceleration of time and how can we do ethnography in these moments of acceleration? And it's very, you know, this is a very down to earth point for somebody trying to collect data in a moment when times move on so quickly, you know, you do your data collection, but before you've even concluded the halfway point, things have changed so enormously. And also this kind of, you, you talk very well about this, um, I liked your, your phrase, disaster developmentalism, you know, this kind of feeling of possibility and change. But again, like for the person doing the research, this kind of ethical impulse that you have to respond to what's happening, the conditions have changed by the time that you have, um, you've gotten through your field work. So it's just the, 
the slow carefulness of ethnography and the difficulty of doing that in these current times, which is, you know, a speeding up of what ethnographers have already been facing. Um, yeah, you know, I was struck again by the possibilities. I think you put that forward quite nicely that, you know, it, it's very stark, the idea of just ethnography coming to a close and being told to stop doing your field work. But the transformation of social life that we're, we're experiencing, you know, the distancing, the closening, the privatizing of life, the opening up of private spheres, the restructuring of ritual, you know, that this is really um, kind of, and this is really kind of rich material for any ethnography. So again, it's that tension between how difficult things are for an ethnographer with this kind of unprecedented time of like, of change, where it offers like so many topics that really can produce kind of fascinating insights. I mean, it's like an enormous breaching experiment that we're living through right now, which is, you know, saying so much about how we kind of ritualize and re-ritualize and how norms endure and how norms shift and so on. Um, I guess the thing that I thought was particularly interesting in your work was about, this is my final point, was just about, I guess, the challenge. I mean, already sort of reflexive method and how you kind of note this kind of reflexive term that happened in response to the imperial legacy of ethnography. And that when we think about this kind of turn to digital ethnography now, how we really need to think about this as being kind of like a re, re going over of the, of the kind of imperial legacies of ethnography as being kind of like an agent of empire and as being an agent of the, I guess, kind of the, the, the American military, the American uh, intelligence apparatus in the Cold War and in World War II, you know, and your points about you know, corporate platforms, infrastructures, the way that this kind of like conditions and conditions interaction, the way it offers up only certain communities and individuals to scrutiny by a, by an ethnographer, um, you know, who is excluded and who will we simply not not um not be able to get access to, which I think is a very interesting thing to think about. I mean, it it makes us go back to this kind of question about the political underpinnings of the enterprise of ethnography. So, I mean, those are my notes on it. I, I appreciated your work very much and there was a lot in it. So thank you very much. And hope those comments are of some, some interest. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, if uh, Igor and Roger think uh, they could um, um, ask the questions very, very quickly. Yeah. And then we'll, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marius. I will be very brief here. I was just want to share my impression um, Thank you very much, and Matthew. That, that I really could relate to it because I was one of those who was rewriting my proposal for Venagran to fit into these uh, demands. And um, yeah, I, I really feel that they put a pressure on the on those who applied, which was dangerous, kind of. It was a temptation because I can see that they were in this complex situation where they try to choose the best uh, option to act. Uh, first, they wanted to cancel all the grants, and then they offered people to transfer to this kind of distant research online or however else. And obviously, many people were just pressured to invent something to get the money so that it would be persuasive enough, but actually not something they would be really believing into. So I really believe that this is a value of contextualization, because it's true that many, especially young scholars, probably leave out a lot of stuff which they can research online or in the libraries and archives and so on. So it might be a good thing to it, but there is a lot of temptation as well because at the end, if you shift the things to the to the online and you don't know, you cannot triangulate, you cannot relate it to anything which you can research in other ways, then you at the end can be counting layers without actually knowing what you are doing and where you're bringing it down to. So uh, I was lucky because I already had a part of my field work done. So and I'm one of those who's looking forward to go back to the field and see how it has changed because it can be really interesting um, discovery. Uh, but I really want to really appreciate it in how, what you have uh, told us now that you, you really reflected this feeling of the object of research and subject of research melting into the thin air in a sense that you are not anymore secure about what you're searching, it, 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 everything becomes more problematized. And this is at the same time enriching experience and a kind of painful, a little bit experience uh, at the same time. 
So it brings a sort of uh, defamiliarization, you can say, a productive othering to your own uh, subject of research, but at the same time, it makes you doubt a lot of things and make everything much more shaky. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Uh, Roger, do you think you could um, mention it very quickly? Literally a comment. I mean, A, I appreciated your interlacing of the, the phenomenological and the private and the personal with the, with the issues raised by disciplines and, and uh, specialist areas of studies. I mean, uh, that, I, I think that's actually the future because we're, we're still unpicking the 19th century positivist myth of objectivity, which was obviously, a, a, now we can see very clearly, a thinly guised piece of neo-colonial consciousness, which still created con constructs of modernity, progress, and pr the primitive and the backward, etc., and all sorts of pseudo-linear uh, trajectories in history. So I, th I think we're struggling now with the collapse of that myth of a privileged platform from which to look at things ethnographically, because ultimately we are also an ethnos and, and somehow we, Western consciousness, especially male Western white consciousness, managed to deny its own existence as a, a particular ethnos. And so we had all this myth about man or anthropos or whatever as a sort of abstraction. But the other thing, I, I, I really am sympathetic to this sense of the crisis of the, the, the sacred or the, the, the sacral. Um, and though it's not about it in the novel, I still like the title of that um, prize-winning book, The God of Small Things, because I link that idea to the dilemma of the sacred in a world that has lost a sort of transcendental traditional religion, and all sorts of stuff that you get in William Blake or Sting or B Bob Dylan or whatever, that actually the sacred is is a dimension of our own everyday experience at the, at the micro level, that in a way what, co what COVID has done has forced people back into the existential necessity to resacralize what used to be seen as the trivial to escape from. I mean, and I would add, put in that category, the family. I mean, my relationship with my son, who's at university doing medicine in Sheffield, meeting with him, having he lived here for years and I took him for granted as it were. And because of the vagaries of COVID, to see him now is a wonderful experience. It's like we've been through a you know, separation by war or plague or something. And of course we haven't, it's quite banal. It's just up the M1 to Sheffield. But I do think that there, lots of people are re-experiencing the capacity of the mind to sacralize the smallest things. And that we, in a way that the sacred is interlaced with the phenomenology of existence once it's experienced in a particular way. And that's the archetypal truth of Eastern mysticism and yoga and all these other things that people do. Even yoga has become commodified and no longer a source of the sacred. But actually uh, there are so many techniques which, can be, uh, which are being discovered under COVID for actually finding the lost big macro sacred in, in the micro sacred. That was, I don't know if you, does that make sense, Matthew? In the yeah, it does. I, I really appreciate that, uh, that feedback from yourself and from, and from others. If you can, ju just a short uh, answer, Matthew, because there's certainly no, no time to, to answer all the questions that have been <laughs> Oh, I, I, I couldn't begin so, to answer all, all of those, all of those yeah. comments. <laughs> um, I, um, I, 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 on the one hand, uh, picking up on what Roger just said, uh, we have the opportunity to rethink what we what is sacred for us, whether it's my, micro or macro. Um, we have an opportunity to reattune to our local environment, whatever local means. But I do have concerns. It, it follows from what I said on Daniel's in response to Daniel's uh, paper. Um, do we start from a good place? So I, I attend many seminars and conferences, and every time there's somebody talking from uh, Australia, North America, South America, it starts with these days with an acknowledgement of indigenous land rights. There's a, there's a concept of local indigeneity, of, a, of a, a, a long perduring link to land. That's never the case with the presentation in Europe. So we start from being in a blasted landscape in Europe which has been sort of um, scrubbed of indi indigeneity. Uh, that troubles me. And I wonder whether we, whether we need to find ways to 
reroute ourselves to actually take advantage of the opportunities in inverted commas of the COVID rupture to, 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 to reconstitute what's sacred for us. Thank you so much, Matt, for uh, this lovely presentation. And uh, thank you everyone for um, this, this um, panel and this day.